everyone can hear me very well. So you all welcome to today's meeting. I'm going to share the screen now. So this is the first meeting for our colloquium schedule for commercial horticulture and small acreage. And to your information, the meeting is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our web page as well. For those who have not been able to join, those who have the chance to uh, watch the videos. And so this is the first meeting that we are having for small scale farmers as a colloquium that will be meeting every month. Commercial Horticulture and Small Acreage is a new program that just started last year in December. So we're trying to put these programs together to support um, commercial horticulture and small acreage growers as much as we can. So um, in brief, cooperative extension is a branch of the university that is taking up educational activities for farmers. And when we look at this slide here, we can see that the investors is right here on our, and the small scale farmers or generally farmers are also on the other side. So what cooperative extension does is that we come in between the investor and then the farmers to bring the knowledge that is available at the investor level to the farmers who are faced with resource constraints and limited information on food security, on food security and also food safety, as well as other production and marketing um, issues. And the aim is to deliver relevant information to growers to help improve communities and then the economy. So this program, basically, that's what we'll be doing. We'll try to liaise with the investors, uh, faculty on campus, and also NGOs and the private sector and government institutions to bring resources uh, that are needed for small-scale growers to be able to improve their productions. So we have a website. Uh, on the website, we're going to focus on soil health and fertility. We we'll also look at integrated pest management, and we we'll look at specialty crops. And then also the program is also focusing on uh, food and uh, small grains. We are also looking at water and irrigation issues, and on-farm food safety. So for this colloquium is going to be five sessions. And today is the first session that we are going to hold. It's going to be every month. And these are the topics that are going to be discussed for each of the months. And the speakers are also here. So today I'm going to lead the talk as a first speaker. And then uh, we also have uh, Professor John Idaho from uh, New Mexico State University, who will be giving us a talk on cover crops. So just after my talk, I will introduce him and then he will take over from there. So for my talk today, I'm looking at manual applications as an alternative sustainable soil health practice. And then we'll look at the pros and the cons on um, using manure in our fields. So basically, soil is made up of these compositions. It's made up of uh, the organic matter, which is the top layer here. That is mostly the humus and then the decaying material from plant and animal. And they also have the, <clears throat> the A horizon, the B horizon, and then the C horizon, which is the bedrock. So mathematically, um, we have this diagram here, we see that the soil is made up of two basic components. So we have the solid uh, soil component, and then we also have the pore space, which is made up of the air and then water. When we look at the solid component, the mineral component is about 45% of the soil, and then we have about 5% organic matter. And then the water component is about 25%, and the air component also about 25%. 
what happens is that when we have a depletion in organic matter, it results into something like this. We have this uh, is a soil profile that I took from the field. So basically you can see that from top to the bottom here, uh, you basically cannot differentiate between which is the organic matter component and then which is the, the subsoil as well. It's the same color. And you don't see so much uh, living activities, root activities going on there. So when the soil organic matter is depleted, this is what happens. It leads to erosion and then a poor soil fertility and others. In the United States uh, here, this graph represents the organic matter uh, depletion state by state. And when we look at uh, Arizona, Arizona is in uh, one of the states that have less organic matter in their soils. And when you look at the dark sections, that represent more organic matter in the soil. And the causes of these uh, depletions are inherent factors, which are climate and then uh, soil texture properties, and then excessive tillage and other uh, on-site practices. So for the inherent factors, we may not be able to do so much about them, but what we can do much about is we can influence the tillage practices and then on-site on uh, farm practices that we put on our fields to manage the organic matter in our soil. So here the question is that, how can we improve soil organic matter, soil health and soil fertility? So today we are going to focus more on uh, using two basic processes which is the use of manure, and then also the use of cover crops. And I'll be looking at the manure component, and then Professor John Edaho will look at the cover crop section. Trends in uh, manure use in uh, um, soil practices in Arizona. This publication indicates that there is some increasing trend from 2012 to 2017 for soil health practices such as no-till, uh, reduced tillage. We also have cover crop increasing, though it uh, represents a small uh, portion of it. And then manure is also a big component uh, that has increased by 30%. So today the focus is on my speak is on cover crops. No, manure, excuse me. And now when we look closely, this is a need assessment that I just did this year to see what uh, small-scale farmers in Yavapai and Coconino County here in Northern Arizona, what the land use practices are and the kind of soil amendments they use. So from here, we can see that uh, this is kind of consistent with what the trends in the states are. And when we look at the soil amendments, the use of compost and then animal manure and green manure are the major practices that the farmers in Northern Arizona use. When we go further, the sources of this manure is basically from um, the goats, we also get from sheep, the cattle, and then from poultry. And I'm going to show you some results that uh, I have from the field uh, recently on poultry application. So when we, to estimate how much manure we have in the field, so basically the first section uh, here, this one is for nitrogen availability from manure. And this first line is organic and to get organic and we have to take total N and subtract the mineral part, which is the ammonium component from it, from our analysis. And then for the first year, we are going to get about 25% when we apply manure, we're going to get 25% availability. And then the following year, we'll get around 12, and then the third year, we'll get around zero, uh, around 6%. And when we take uh, phosphorus, the first year, we'll get around 7%. 
and then the following year will get around two percent and then um six percent downwards and when we take p it's about nine percent these are the factors that we can use to calculate how much we make we get our nutrient available in the soil when we apply compost so to get the estimation we just have to multiply for example p we multiply 0 0.7 by the total p value that we get from our analysis and then we'll be able to determine how much of the p will be available uh, for the first year and then for the second year to we do the same we'll get we'll multiply by 0 0.2 we'll be able to get how much p will be available for the second year as well so for the pros and cons, so generally manure is a cheap source of uh, fertilizer to be used. And it's also known to improve uh, soil health through carbon sequestration. And it improves soil fertility as well. It's a sustainable source uh, to use. And also it improves uh, soil physical and water holding capacities. But when we look at the pros, we can see that it could be a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then it could also be a food safety concern due to heavy metals and pathogens in the manure, zoonotic diseases. So we also see that it could also pollute our water bodies when we don't manage it well and it's being washed into the rivers. So definitely nitrate and then P uh, is a big concern here, which is the reason why we have to really know how to manage uh, the manure we put in our fields. So here is an example of uh, manure application at the DK Ranch. So the, gray, the bars that are not filled in are the analysis that was done before the application of manure started at the field. And this other bars, the 2020, it's after three years of manual application. And as we can see here, we can see that it has influenced the cation exchange capacity by 40%. And the nitrate is reduced by 26%, which I will explain a little bit further. And then uh, P is also increased by 471%. And then we see other nutrients also increase as well, except for uh, iron and then um, copper. For the reason why nitrate is reducing, we can see that the field is being flooded. It's flood irrigation that is used on site. And as we all know, nitrate is a very mobile nutrient that when you continuously flood the field, you're going to easily wash it down beneath where uh, plants can even reach it. And even it can get into, this is where it gets into our water bodies as well and cause problems. So this is um, one of the reasons why that happens. The field is also not, tilted. So when they apply manure, it's left on surface, it's not incorporated. That means that <clears throat> chunk of the nitrogen is also being converted into ammonia and then it can escape uh, into the atmosphere as ammonia gas. So this may be some of the reasons why the nitrate component here is reduced. However, the salt content is kind of stable and that we can associate to the flood irrigation that is washing the salt content uh, beneath the surf soil surface of where we can reach it. So the question is now is, are we using manure the right way? Uh, for example, uh, concerning our food, our health, food safety issues, and also the environmental issues. So food safety issues, uh, health safety related to pathogenic uh, contaminations like salmonella and um, others. And then the environmental concerns is also about nitrogen and then phosphorus in our rivers and others. So I'm going to give you some of the sources how uh, uh, this end loss is okay in manure. So basically, 
This diagram indicates that we are getting the manure from this cow here. The, the cow excreted the manure. And this house here is the storage facility. <coughs> This house here is a is a house for the man uh, the cow excuse me. So during in the housing from uh, the cows, the manure that is excreted about three to six percent is lost within the housing system. And when we move the manure from the housing system to storage, about three to twenty eight percent is also lost during storage. And when we move from storage and apply it in the field, about 30 to 53% is lost in the field. So basically, how can we manage these losses so that we can maximize how much N we get from our manual applications? So in this diagram, this is losses that occur in the field. In the field, we have our manure here, and uh, the end sources that we get from manure is, uh, is it either comes as organic, mineralized to ammonia, and then it can escape as ammonia gas, which is a volatile compound. So the moment it is converted from ammonium to ammonia, which is uh, by some nitrogen uh, microorganisms, which are nitrification microorganisms, that is becoming a gas as ammonia, so it easily escapes into the air. It can also, when it moves from ammonia to nitrate form, which is the form that mostly plants use, it can also get lost as nitrogen oxide when denitrification bacteria act on it and convert the nitrate into nitrous oxide. And it can also uh, get lost in the field through leaching, or microorganisms can immobilize it. They can use the, nit the nitrate, that's what they also use as their source of energy. So when they use as their source of energy, they are immobilizing it, and that can also become available when mineralization occurs. So this is how the end losses occur in our manure when we put them in the field. How can we minimize this? To minimize this at the housing level, we can do that by quickly moving the manure to storage. And during storage, we can also minimize it by covering the surface or reducing the surface of the storage facility. So when we put our manure there, we should try and cover it or we should reduce the surface area just to minimize the gases uh, loss. And in the field, what we can do is that we can do incorporation, incorporate the manure immediately into the soil after application. And also we can use plant uh, cover crops or catch crops. So instead of putting the manure during winter and waiting until somewhere spring, we start, we put in there and we put cover crops there. Um, John will talk more about that, so I'll leave it out. Zeolite is also something that we can use. It has a very high uh, cation exchange capacity and can hold, uh, uh, for example, the ammonium form of nitrogen. It can hold it and uh, act as kind of like a nitrification inhibitor. And so that can also be used to reduce the end losses from manure. So this, this is giving us a brief summary of the amount of losses that we can avoid when we do incorporation. So for example, here is a beef from the cow. A beef we have the first year, if we apply manure and we do not incorporate after four days, we do incorporation after four days, we are going to be losing this amount. And if we do incorporation after 12 to 96 hours, this is how much, no, this is the availability, sorry. This is the availability. If we incorporate within four days, the availability is about 25. And if we incorporate within 12 hours, availability is about 
45%. And when we go to the second year, this remains the same. And the losses after four days of incorporation is about 40%. And losses about uh, 12 hours of incorporation, about 20%. 20, 20 that has reduced by half. But when we come incorporating within 12 hours, Within 12 hours, we have minimized the losses to only 5% here. So that's uh, emphasized the issue of incorporation, how important it is to incorporate the manual immediately after application. And when we look at this, uh, the theory two, it's also similar. We see that the losses are minimized when we incorporate within 12 hours. And the swine to the same, similar. And poultry manual is also the same. We see that the losses have been reduced drastically when we do incorporation within 12 hours. Yeah, so uh, basically, this is uh, the last slide that I'm going to show you. So, uh, composting is also one of the options that we can use to minimize the losses. I uh, will do composting before using the manual cover crops, which John will talk more about that. And the other thing we have to look at for, for food safety reasons, when we apply manure, we should allow 90 days for plants that do not have direct contact with soil. And the plants that will have direct contact with soil that we have applied our manure, we should allow 90 days uh, from day of application before harvesting. And zeolite, as I spoke about, is one of the options that we can also use to reduce uh, manual loss uh, and losses in manual applications. So thank you for the attention. We'll hold our questions to the end of the session and then uh, we'll work through the questions together. So I'll hand over to John. John, if you're available, you can take over from this point and give us uh, your talk. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now, just a minute. So, um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, build on what um, Isaac has started, you know, by talking about cover crops. My name is Johnny Dou. I'm an extension agronomist with NMSU um, and, uh, I work on crop and soils mostly. Uh, yes, the outline for presentation this uh, evening is, uh, I've listed it on this slide. We talk about cover crop, what is cover crop, the purpose of cover crops, and then some general considerations for cover crop. And then we talk about the classification and selection of cover crops. And then I'll talk about some individual cover crops that has worked very well here in New Mexico that will also work well in Arizona. And then uh, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about water use and, you know, talk about some limitations, you know, with cover crop use. So what is a cover crop? A cover crop is um, a crop that you go, grow in between the cash crop cycles. That, that is, you grow your cash crop and then you have an interval in between the next cash crop and then you fill that interval with another crop which you are not going to use as cash crop, which is basically going to benefit the soil. And um, that's one way to, to define cover crop. And then another definition is a, a crop that you intercrop with a cash crop to cover the bare ground. You know, especially we see um, among um, some of the three uh, crop produ producers, um, they want to cover the uh, lower canopy with a particular crop, maybe clovers or whatever, you know, a compatible crop. So they grow the compatible crop on the lower level of the canopy just to cover the ground and provide some ecosystem services. And then um, another definition is a plant that is planted in absence of normal crop. Maybe you want to follow your land, you want to leave it to follow. Instead of just leaving it and allowing weeds to take over, you just plant a cover crop there until you are ready to use the land again. And the, the, the basic reason why you are growing cover crop is first of all to protect the soil and then to add organic matter and nutrients to the soil. 
you know but organic matter is perhaps the most one of the most important benefits of growing cover crops but it's important to understand that you know cover crop is not a harvested uh, component of the uh, of the system when you have cover crop in your rotation you know because some people grow let's say they grow winter wheat and then growing winter wheat for forage is different from growing winter wheat for as cover crop you know so if you go back and then cut and bale everything clean shape the soil and nothing is going back into the soil maybe perhaps some of the roots then that's not really an effective cover crop you know in some cases yeah there is a partial harvest where you know some growers will you know cut whatever for it they want to cut set their cotton uh, cotton height very high and then leave some considerable residue you know that's a compromise that some farmers are doing these days you know so but basically it, the best thing is to leave that cover crop there in order to benefit the um the soil and then provide services for the cash crop that comes after so the purpose of fourth cover crops i've listed there we're all familiar with all these you know erosion control to protect the soil nitrogen fixation for instance legumes they have capacity to fix nitrogen so if you have legume as cover crop then you are adding nitrogen to the soil then also biomass for soil health improvement and then supply of nutrients um, reducing soil compaction weed insects disease suppression those are all benefits that we get from cover crops and then also habitats for beneficial organisms like birds insects and all other kind of organisms so we'll be mentioning some of these things along the line as we go on then some general consideration to think about before you put in cover crops you know um like soil conditions is very important what texture do you have do you have a and do you have high salinity? Because if you if you have high salinity, some cover crops may not work. It's happened to me before that I planted a cover crop that were on a, on a soil that had high salinity. The salinity was five decimals per meter, and I was using this cover crop, and they were all stunted. I thought that, what is going on? Do I have a disease problem on this crop? No, it wasn't disease. It was, um, it was uh, salinity. And then I grew barley. Bali is very salt tolerant and they all did excellently well in the same soil. So the soil, I mean, so you have to know what condition of your soil is. And then some cover crops do better in well-drained soil than in, um, in uh, heavy textured soils. Then the drainage condition, that's also very important. And then also you have to think about whether it fits into your rotation. You know, not all cover crops are created equal. You know, if you use an incompatible cover crop, it can really be a problem. In fact, if you use cover crop inappropriately, it can be a curse rather than a blessing. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. And also, which season, you know, do you want to grow the cover crop? Is this winter or summer cover crop you're looking for? And then you also, do you need some special soil preparation? maybe especially for cover crops that are small seeded. I remember some years back, I wanted to grow clover and, you know, the ground was rough. Mm, I mean, I, I had total cover crop failure, you know, because I didn't want to prep the land and, you know, put the clover in their very tiny seeds. And so I, I, I just could not get that crop to grow, the cover crop to grow. And also another thing you have to think about is irrigation. You know, cover crops, especially at the initial stages, need some water. Do you have enough water to raise the cover crop? Those are the kind of consideration you have to think about before you go into cover cropping. Then let's talk about classification of cover crops. And um, they are classified based on several criteria. Um, the first one there on this slide is the way the cover crop is used, you know, is it as a catch crop, you know, like Isaac was mentioning what a catch crop is. Basically, a catch crop is a crop you grow in order to absorb or take up the nutrients that is resident is in the soil, residual nutrients in the soil after your catch crops. Maybe you've applied some um, uh, fertilizer into that crop, into that ground, and then some of them have leached beyond the rooting zone of your catch crop. So you put in a cover crop that is deep rooted in order to absorb those the excess nutrients that have gone into the subsoil, and then so that it enters into the into the uh, cover crop, and then you can incorporate the cover crop later into the soil so that it provides 
an added benefit of releasing that nutrients that could otherwise have been lost. Then green manure, basically green manure is the same thing as cover crop. It's only that green manure you are targeting it straight to uh, supply nutrients to the soil, you know. In, yeah. So you have to um, adjust the way you manage it. Then living mulches, that's another possibility. You know, there are times you have living mulches, that is, you grow, um, like what I was talking about, intercropping, uh, cover crop, under tree crop production. Production. So you can have a living mulch at the, at the lower level of canopy, and then it uh, sort of protects the soil and adds nitrogen to the soil. If it's clover, it's a nitrogen fixing crop, cover crop. And also, you can classify cover crops according to the type of crop that you plant, whether you, you can call them grasses, legumes, or brassica. So that's another way cover crops are classified. Um, but the one we focus more on here today is when they are planted, whether they are summer or winter cover crops. I will mention some specific summer and specific winter cover crops as we go on in the presentation. So what is winter cover crops? You know, winter pro cover crops are planted late in the summer or fall. And basically they are covering the ground for that period of time where you know, the, 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 uh, the weather is going into the winter season and then up till the early spring. So you want to make sure that the ground is covered and protected from the elements, you know, from uh, erosion and all kinds of different things that, that can happen. And then the key thing is that the winter cover crops has to be cold tolerant. That is, they must be able to tolerate lower temperatures because typically we have uh, lower uh, temperatures in winter, although it's not as severe in Arizona. But here in Las Cruces, you know, you have to select for cover crops that can withstand winter. Otherwise, you know, the, they will not survive. Then it's critical to plant on time before the temperature becomes too low. So that's another thing we look at in cover crop. If you plant too late, then the cover crop may not establish because the temperature is too low for the seed to germinate and emerge from the soil. For instance, example of winter hardy crops are hairy veg and cereal rye. You know, we've used those here, you know, and, um, you know, and it's been very successful. So they can tolerate winter. And then cool season legumes include several clovers, veggies, medics, and field peas. So there are a number of varieties of um, cover crops you can use within your systems. Then let's talk about the warm season cover crops. You know, um, they are planted in summer and it's mostly as green manure, you know, so you want to improve the poor soils and uh, you want to, you know, prov uh, provide the land with some, maybe some mineral and some nutrients like nitrogen, for instance, you know, for your winter cash crop and, uh, you know, or you want to prepare your land for perennial crops. So summer cover crops can be very useful um, in doing that, you know, and there are so many summer cover crops we can grow within this region like cowpeas, sweet clover, sesbania, goa, crotalaria. So I've used some of them before. I'll be sharing some of the information with you as we go ahead. Then how cover crops affect the soil? Like I said before, it will add organic matter to the soil. That's the first critical thing that our soil lack. You know, um, Isaac was showing you a soil profile that you couldn't, I mean, the color was uniform from top to bottom. That's not really how a soil profile should look. A good soil profile should not look like that. A good soil profile should have a dark upper layer, maybe the first six to eight inches, you know, should be dark because of the organic matter accumulation. But in some soil, say we don't see that because it's very hard to accumulate organic matter, especially in arid regions. It's a very great challenge. And then, so organic matter is number one thing that, you know, cover crops will will uh, try to bring back into the soil profile. Then also the cover crops can break soil compaction. I mentioned that as we move on. And then it can also help conserve moisture that is protect and also protect the soil from wind and water erosion, supply nutrients and you know uh, suppress weeds and diseases. So those are very great benefits of cover crops. And then when you want to select cover crops, there are some decisions you have to make. You know, I've mentioned some of the considerations at the beginning, but here, these are specific decisions that, you know, you have to go through and think about. First of all, what is your goal? 
You know, many people think that cover crops is something you can just choose anything and put in. No, you don't want to do that. What is your goal? Is my goal to uh, break the compaction layer or to add organic matter? Or um, do I want to add nitrogen to the soil? Or you, I want to suppress weeds? What are your goals? So establish your goals first before you decide on which cover crop to choose. And then after that, you have to look at options that are available from the seed vendors around your area. There are some very nice cover crops I've heard so much about, but by the time I ask my, my vendor, you know, they don't have it and they say, well, we can get it for you. And then they mention the price. I just tell them, no, thanks, because it's too expensive. So those are the kind of thing you have to think about. So what options are available? What cover crops are available? And then when is the seeding time? You have to know that that's very critical. And what are the management practices? How do I terminate that cover crop? We had a very uh, serious experience this past, um, I mean, last year. One of the, my students, you know, doing work with mustard, with brassica. So we planted this on one of the growers' um, farm, and um, we thought that were brassica, they are very good in, in that they can serve as uh, soil fumigants. They can sort of address weeds and pathogens in the soil. So they are very good because they release a substance called glucosinolate, glucosinolate, and that hydrolyzes in the soil and it attacks soil borne diseases and, and, and weed seeds. So we had it grow, but now when it came to time to terminate, the farmer went too far and the roots were very strong in the soil. So he didn't have enough uh, you know, I mean, his equipment could not get rid of those roots. So those cover crops became a problem for him, you know. So it's important to know the management practices that you need to terminate that cover crop. If you terminate it too late, it can grow into weeds. You can get seeds build up and it starts becoming weeds. And if you terminate, um, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have equipment to terminate, then, you know, it can affect your or your uh, cash crop, you know, because it will set you back on time. In fact, that's what it did for this farmer because they had to go through different, um, it was an on-farm trial, he would have to go through different uh, uh, tillage practice, uh, tillage methods and practices, and he set his planting back by two weeks before we could effectively control the cover crop. And then some other details about the cover crop you need to know, you know, um, ask the vendors and ask extension specialists about specific cover crops. What are the things that I need to know? I want to use this cover crop. What is What are the potential problems and potential benefits? And for instance, this is um, um, a, 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 a table that uh, I, I got from, you know, Cornell Cooperative Extension. I like the way they've classified different cover crops. You see on the left-hand side, you see the different cover crops and then their overwinter ability, biomass amount, Struct, soil structure improvement. That is how much they can influence these different factors. And when you have three stars, it means that it has a high impact, you know, relatively high. Moderate is two stars and relatively low. For instance, when you look at annual rye grass, it's, you know, it doesn't overwinter. It would winter kill in the Northeast. And then biomass amount is kind of moderate, but the soil structure improvement is very high. So they develop that for different cover crops. It's something we are trying to do for our cover crops around in the Southwest here, you know, to get this kind of table so that we can help um, the farmers to know which cover crops to choose for different services that they want them to provide. Then I will now talk about some specific cover crops, you know, um, let's start with warm season cover crops. I've listed a few there, which I've tried, I mean, I've tried all of, all of these ones and they work very well, cow peas, you know, you uh, lab lab, pigeon pea, buckwheat, pearl millet. Where well, Sogom Sudan, I put them, um, you know, uh, do, double uh, question mark there because, you know, and says Benia, they are very aggressive cover crops, you know, so you must be careful the way you manage them, you know, and um, uh, and they also demand a lot of water. So, I mean, especially Sogom Sudan. So, I put them there as the last, you know, for vegetable systems, if you are looking for summer cover crops, I will stay in the upper part, you know, the cowpeas and lab lab, they are very excellent. So looking, um, and most of the time you plant these uh, cover crops between March and July, you know, if there is a space for your, in your cropping system, there may not be space because most of the time 
there is cash crop during that time. But in some systems, you know, you may have some space that where you can plant something in July. You know, maybe you've taken something out of the field in July and then you, you put, um, you know, you, you put the cover crop, summer cover crops down. Like cowpeas and loud lab, they are good nitrogen uh, fixers. My top choice would be cowpeas. You know, they're very good in that, you know, um, they fix very uh, nitrogen very, very aggressively. And they're very compatible with our soil. So you don't even need to inoculate the seeds. I've, you know, without inoculating, I always find nodules on them most of the time. But it's safe to inoculate if you want to use them, if the inoculant is available. So it can fix up to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and it provides excellent wheat suppression, easy to manage, can grow in poor soils and, uh, you know, uh, sandy, and, and it can, you know, uh, survive in sandy and clay soil. So it's, it doesn't discriminate which soil type. And then one of the interesting things is that it can reduce nematode population in soil. So if you have nematode problems, this is a very good cover crop that can also act as a rotation crop that will break the cycle of that nematode. So it's highly recommended when it comes to that. Then Lab Lab is another one, you know, which is um, also very well. I've worked with uh, with uh, with it very well, and it, it grows very well and covers very well and fixes nitrogen, and it's also easy to manage. And, um, you know, it grows in alkaline soil, clay soils very well, very drought tolerant. But in, in contrast to cowpea, going back to that cowpea, it's only this variety that I can vouch for, iron and clay variety, that suppresses nematodes. I'm not sure about the other variety. So if you are going to ask for it, ask for this variety, iron and clay variety. You know, a lot of research work has been done on that. Then Lab Lab, they can serve as host to nematodes. So if you have nematodes in the soil, you don't want to plant this because it's going to increase the population. They look at Lab Lab that we, we worked with it, you know, in some of our trials, you know, some several years back, Lab Lab on the left, and cowpea on the right, you can see they grow very well. And you know, in the summer, they can generate a huge amount of biomass and fix a lot of nitrogen, you know, for you know for for your crop. Then buckwheat is another you know um, uh, possibility, you know, which grows rapidly, and you know, it also can do well in sandy and clay soil. And well, poultry poultry animals love it, but it's toxic to horses. You don't want to feed horses on this. And we're not established well if you have disease pressure, you know, if the soil has a high bond, you know, actually I experienced that we tried to establish it in a soil with a huge pathogen load. It was just after a chili crop that had phytophthora in that soil. So that soil has had history of different pathogens. We tried to establish it there. It was just a failure. And then buckwheat can harbor insects. Insect pests, including ligos. Ligos box is it's not cotton growers will not they will not be happy if you if they are introduced ligos ligos box close to their field. So and also nematode can serve as host to nematode. So, but if you don't have nematode problem and there is no cotton grower or any uh, susceptible plant nearby, it's an excellent um, you know crop that you know improves soil aggregation quite a bit. Paramillet is another one we've used in the summer, you know, um, it's uh, also, it germinates rapidly, provides good biomass and, uh, you know, an organic matter and also has low nutrient requirement and it's also drought tolerant. So, and one of the good things there is that it's effective against root lesion nematodes. And, you know, if you leave it, if you just plant it, you know, at the end of the season, you're able to get some biomass from it and you leave it, it will winter kill. Actually, the way I've used it before is, you know, I, I, they can still grow towards the end of the season. Once I've taken whatever I have in the field that I'll just grow them and I let them grow. They won't grow very, you know, too much, but they will cover the ground and they will winter kill. And then in the spring, I can use, I can, you know, just uh, seed into the residue. So I've done that before and it works. Well, Southern Sudan, we all are familiar with that. You know, it provides a lot of biomass. And, you know, it bet, uh, well, it's supposed to be drought tolerant because it will, if you reduce the amount of water, it will not grow very fast. But ordinarily, Southern Sudan loves water if you want to generate a good biomass, you know. But it can provide a very good weed suppression. And, you know, um, it can regrow if you mow it, you know. So, but um, I will... I will not so much dwell on this because of its uh, water requirement. Then another one which I've used very extensively, you know, is um, 
says Benia exaltata. That's the variety. I mean, that's the the one I've used. The, the species I've used, and it it can produce huge biomass. You can see on this side of the of the slide is huge. In fact, I mean, when I first started using it, and then one day I went to the farm. I wanted to take data. I just went back. I said, well, there might be some snakes. <laughs> hiding under this place. I, I'm not going to go in until somebody is around so that in case something happens, then somebody is there. So it can produce very huge biomass and it's a nitrogen fixing legume. And it fixes nitrogen in a very, very, you know, high level, high amount of nitrogen. And uh, you can see the nodules on, on the lower part. It's very, very good nodulation and it's easy, easy to manage. You know, provided you don't let it go into seeding. That's the downside of this. Once it goes into seeding, then you are in trouble for several years. It can become an, a, you know, an invasive weed, you know, because it will keep on, you know, providing seeds. So the best thing is to terminate just at the flowering stage, and then you are good. Now let's go to cool seasons uh, because my time is going, you know, I've just, I listed some uh, cool season cover crops there. Annual rye grass, oats, wheat, barley, and rye, they're all good. Clover, vetch, Austrian winter peas, and forage radish. We'll go through them quickly. Annual rye grass is also called Italian rye grass, you know, and um, it produces a good cover within four to six weeks and it can suppress uh, weeds very, very seriously. And you interplant with, leg you can interplant with legumes. And, uh, you know, if it's going too fast for legumes, you can mow it. It tolerates sh shading and uh, difficult to control if it goes into seed. So it's very important to know that. Then oats, wheat, barley, and rye, those are, you know, the normal grasses we are used, uh, used to. They produce excellent biomass. You can use all of them as cover crops, you know, and uh, they provide good wheat suppression. You can also interplant them with different legume species like peas, vetch, and clovers. But the key thing is that don't let them go into seeding. Make sure once they start heading out, just mow them. One good thing with these grasses is that once you mow them, they are mute. They dry in place. So they are easy to terminate, you know, even without herbicide, you know. What I've done before is to mow them and leave, and mow them and leave them in place. And then when I'm ready, I just strip till into those residue straight. And I've been able to grow so many things like that, just through strip tillage or even no till into the residue. So it provides, I mean, they, they, they don't really come back once you mow them. Then clovers, there are different kind of clovers. They are good. Also, um, they, they fix nitrogen, you know, and then they're beneficial insects habitat, habitat and they can serve as forage too. But in this case, we're interested in cover crops. And, uh, you know, at times, you, you know, uh, it's difficult to establish in cracking clay soils. I tried that before. I, I, it didn't work very well, you know. So you can interplant winter cereals with clovers. You can mix them with um, all those winter grasses. Hairy vetch is another one that we've tried there that works very well. Also very fixes nitrogen very well, you know. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's also, uh, you know, very cold tolerant and produces very good biomass. So hairy vetch is another possibility for, for our zone here for, for this Southwest. And also the Austrian winter peas, that's an excellent nitrogen fixing legume if you need to add nitrogen to your soil. And then, you know, it has benefits. It can also have beneficial insect um, habitat, you know, insects love, uh, they love um, Austrian winter peas. And uh, you can also interplant with all the different types of um, uh, summer um, winter grasses and other, you know, legumes too. So it's compatible with many. You can inter interplant it with other things. And another one which I want to mention, the last one is the forage radish, which it, you can use to break the compaction layer in the soil. And also it's, it's a brassica. So it can provide some um, fumigating properties to the soil. It can, pro it can serve as soil bi biocide, you know, ability to control nematodes and some of the soil path pathogens. And also it can serve as catch crop because it can grow deep and absorb those nutrients within the soil that is there that the catch crop cannot get to. So, um, okay, yeah, so that's, uh, you can see the holes here on the right, you know, after the harvest, you can see how the holes are punched in, they pull them out. So it breaks the compaction, it has strong root that goes in, breaks the compaction layer, and then uh, the water will infiltrate better and the soil will perform better after forage radish. 
And then there are so many cover crop cocktail mixes, you know, that is what is common these days. A lot of vendors are, you know, bringing that up, which is quite, it, they have, I mean, it's quite effective if you get the right kind of mix. And um, what is all this? Yeah, <laughs> the, the mixes, they provide insurance against cover crop failure when you have a mixture. So at least something will work within that mix and it provides multiple benefits for different species in the mix. So if you plant, let's say legume with grasses, the grasses provide more organic matter to the soil while legumes provide nitrogen to the soil. So you have uh, you know, um, mixture and benefits of different components of the mixes. And then also it enhanced microbial diversity. So this is a mix we did several years back. We, we, we did sesbenia and palmilla. Sesbenia is also aggressive growing. So you have to match crops at times with the type of crop that they can grow with very well. Otherwise, they will, one would suppress the other and you wouldn't see anything. So sesbenia was growing with palmilla. Sesbenia is the one that has this um, leaf here. You can see sesbenia here. And then this is the uh, palmillet. Then with sorghum Sudan too, it grew very well. We mixed that. And then um, one of the uh, research we did several years back was uh, to look at different mixes. We started with sesbenia and palm millet, sesbenia and sorghum Sudan, then lab lab alone, a mixture of eight species. We, got, we just put everything in the mix. Sorghum Sudan, palm millet, lab lab, sesbenia, cowpea, buckwheat, hairy vetch, and guar. And you can see what we found out. You know, We found out that with mixture of eight species, you know, we had a high level of biomass produced within this uh, within the system, compared to you know um, single. This is a single, and even some two combi two species combination. So we had the highest bi biomass where we had eight species combination. So there is a point to growing those mixtures. The only thing is that you have to talk to your vendor which mixes have been recommended for a particular. Uh, area or for a particular season. So they will give you the right kind of mix so that you don't just put a mix that won't work there. And this is another trial we did several years back, looking at sesbina, you can see sesbina with, you know, 12.9 tons per acre biomass. That's huge. You know, actually you don't leave it to this level because it's just too much biomass to deal with. But that biomass was able to supply all the nitrogen we need to raise all the winter cereals. We planted rye, oats, barley, and wheat, and everything, none of them needed extra nitrogen throughout the winter because all the nitrogen uh, that they needed was provided by sesbenia residue because it's a nitrogen fixing legume. So these are all legumes that we tried and they all produce very good biomass. Then one of the uh, major issues when it comes to cover crop is, you know, uh, the time you incorporate it and it starts breaking down and the time for the peak crop demand for nutrient. Most of the time, it's this is the the peak mineralization. Where, when you incorporate the cover crop, you start seeing the, between three and six weeks, you, you see a lot of mineralization taking place. But the peak demand for your crop may not come until seven or eight weeks. So it's a major problem and um, it's something that is difficult to match. It's almost impossible because you have to incorporate your crop before you, you plant and then it takes time for your crop to be able to get to a point where they attain uh, maximum um, uh, nutrient uh, demand. So that's one of the challenges you know, that we face when we are using cover crop. So that's why at times cover crop cannot provide all the nutrients that you need for your, for your crop. You have to do soil tests and know what supplementary nutrients you need in order to you know, address, uh, uh, your, address the, uh, the requirement of your crop. So what I use matters, I'm almost finishing now. So um, I like this chart, you know, it's a cover crop chart developed by USDA, looking at different cover crops and their water use requirements. First of all, on that, you see the growth cycle, the plant architecture, and then the relative water use, whether it's low, medium, or high. So you can see different cover crops have been classified. For instance, when you look at, um, uh, let's look at uh, um, foxtail millet, for instance. It has a low water requirement. I've, I've tried it before. It's a summer, uh, summer grass that you can try. And then palm millet is also low water requirement. Proso millet is medium. So this kind of table can help us to know 
wheat cover crops uses less water so that we can conserve our water resources. And also it will show you whether it's an upright or a spreading type or prostrate or whether the growth circle is annual, biennial or perennial. So, you know, so not all cover crops are created equal. So this kind of um, uh, system and this kind of chart can help us into looking at what can be used for our different, um, you know, systems. So finally, the limitations Management of cover crop is key to success. You've got to manage it well, otherwise it can become a problem on your hands. The cost of seed and application needs to be justified. Some seeds are very expensive. So you can't justify using those seeds as cover crop because it's, it's going to affect your farm income. So you can look for alternative types of cover crops. The water consumption of cover crops may reduce soil moisture and harm the following cash crop. It's not going to be much of a problem in Arizona where all the systems are irrigated. But in the dry land um, production system in the eastern part of New Mexico, for instance, you know, you have to be careful about cover crops. If you grow some cover crops like cereal rye, it will dry down the profile. It provides organic matter, but at the end of the day, if you are dry land farming, you rely on natural precip, then your crop is going to fail afterwards because there will not be enough water in the profile for your crop to use, and your cash crop to use, to grow. So you have to balance that as well. And then it may reduce soil temperature in some areas, causing glow, slow growth in uh, cooler regions. You know, if the, a, reg a particular region is cool, you are on a high elevation, then you have to watch out for this because cover crops, when you grow them, they can really cover the soil and reduce the temperature at germination. And, you know, we also need to balance the nutrient value and the cost of cover crop production, you know, and see, I mean, what is going on there. And then you also have to watch out for cover crops that hurting, uh, about certain insects and diseases that can affect surrounding plants and vegetation or the cash crop that you grow after. So that's where I'll stop. Um, thank you very much. And um, we're open to questions now. Thank you very much, John, for the great presentation. So now we open uh, for questions, if there is any question, just unmute yourself and ask, or you can leave uh, the question in the chat box and then we'll attend to it. I'm going to also post a link, which is uh, kind of like a survey link to just assess the presentations and to see if we have gotten something from. So just click on the link and then you can just uh, follow and it's just about 30 seconds questions to fill up. Thank you. Time for questions now. John, I wanted to ask you about um, the timing for if you want to winter kill. Can you do like uh, really cropping kind of so that whilst the cover crop is still uh, growing, you put in your main crop uh, to grow whilst, and so that during the winter, uh, the main crop will keep on growing and then the cover crop will be killed. And what will be the timing to do that? Yeah, it depends on what system you want. You know, in which case you are, you are talking of a summer cover crop, right? Yes. So putting a summer cover crop in and then putting um, a winter um, cash crop in, in between, you know, later on, so that this, the summer cover crop will winter kill. Well, it, it's it's possible, but at the same time, it's risky, you know, because um, you want your cash crop to be well established, you know, so that um, you don't, uh, you know, affect that crop. Because suppose the winter doesn't become so severe. For instance, let me give an example. You know, when I was working in the northeast, you know, we always use oats as um as a cover crop and it winter kills every time you know and then i was thinking of doing that here i grew it and then i said well it will winter kill and it never it never died <laughs> you know that this winter it, it kept on growing by the time i got to the spring the thing was huge you know and large so it didn't winter kill so you if you want to do that you must really be sure that the crop is going to winter kill you know, because we have some issues here, you know, our weather is not, things have been changing and varying over the past years, you know, since I've been here, you know, some things that you think will, in fact, you won't believe I've grown what 
cover crop in January, and it worked. It, it, it worked very well. Normally, you don't grow cover crop. I mean, in, if you have northern latitudes, nobody will ever seed cover crop in January. End of January, I seeded some cover crops, and it, for years now, it's been working. So winter may not be severe enough to kill that crop. So it's a risk. I would rather, if you want to winter kill, I would rather not plant a cash crop. I just plant that crop and like, okay, let's say I want to use sperm millet. I grow it at the end of the season. Definitely, that is a very easy, it dies in winter most of the time. So I'll just leave it there and then I come back in the spring and grow whatever I want to grow. But I'm very scared to put in a crop that I think will winter kill and it doesn't winter kill, you know, and then, um, you know, it competes with my cash crop and I run into problems. There is another question uh, that is on cover crops that says that any resources you can recommend to research cover crops for higher pH soils, uh, 7.8 plus? Yeah, you know, I think what there is this, um, you need to check this book out, you know, this cover crop book uh, written by um, SARE, S-A-R-E, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. They have a very excellent book there, you know. Um, I've forgotten the exact name. I think it's Building Soil for co I mean, Cover Crop Rotation. I've forgotten the exact and Send the link to you. It's a book that is available online. You can download it. So it's a lot of information there. You can check those things out there and see whether you'll be able to get some information from there. So it's, it's a book that if you even go to Western SEER website, just or SEER website, S-A-R-E, and then you just type Cover Crops. You, the, 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 the book will be available. It's, it's, it's uh, quite a, a, a comprehensive book that you can check and see some of those information there. Uh, there is another question on cover crops uh, that is saying that summer cover crops recommendation to suppress soybean diseases. You mentioned buckwheat. It's not... Um, it's not good for that, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it, well soybean diseases, you know... I, that is a tough one, you know. Those brassicas, they are good for soybean diseases, but they are winter species, you know. They are things you grow in the winter, you know. Okay. So um, the the only one that I know that you know works very well to to suppress nematodes, particularly, is that cowpea iron and clay variety. It suppresses um, nematodes in the soil, you know. It's very good and excellent for that. But for for um, soybean diseases, I'm not quite sure, you know, but I know that if you, if you grow brassica in winter, then you can, you can actually get the benefits, you know, as you go into the uh, springtime cropping of your cash crop. Awesome. I think we're running out of time, but Daniel just posted, I think the sorry um, book that you mentioned about the cover crop, uh, Daniel posted a link. That oh, that's good. Leads us to the book, so everyone can managing that. cover crops profitably. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. the name. Managing cover crops profit profitably. Thank you for posting. It's a very good book. You can check a lot of uh, information there, and it's very comprehensive, and you learn a lot from that book. Yeah. Maybe no. the last question here. I am growing a summer crop Sudan cover crop planted in June twenty one to build soil and support weed for perennial planting. Oh. When is the best time to detect, to terminate, to build soil micro communities? I also want planning to mow it and cover it with tar. Yeah, well, typically, if you grow, uh, you know, sorghum Sudan, I mean, Sudan, you know, you're looking at maybe, say, three months, you know, you, you generate enough biomass, you know, June, July, August. By August, September, you want to terminate, you know, otherwise, you know, it starts becoming so big and aggressive. So, if you want to, um, you want to cover it with tarp, yeah, you can do that, you know, definitely the winter kill, that's a good thing, but if you cover them with tarp, they will still grow, I mean, depending on your the level you if you cut them, you know, say below six inches below, then they will they will be gone for good. But if you cut them above six inches, they will grow a little bit back, you know, over the before the winter finally kills them, you know. So if you want to put them under the tree, maybe you have to cut it pretty low, you know. Um, or is that what you want to do? I don't know under the tarp because they are so tall. You have to cut them 
very low so that you put them under the tap there they will rot and they will die over the winter so but by august september you want to get rid of them okay want to it terminate. Is it possible that we can uh, do if the tap is earlier could the heat help to kind of solarize it mm, well well if you it depends you know I mean, you don't i don't i don't think you need i mean the, the, what the basic thing you're looking for there is for the um residue to to contribute to the organic matter yeah. so um you know so the is unless you want to you know sterilize for soil microbes you want to kill soil microbes under the tarp but generally sorghum sudan doesn't need any kind of sterilization all you need to do is to make sure that those residue get inside the soil either they stay on the surface you can cut them on the surface and you know put them on that tarp no it doesn't matter you know um they will eventually get into the soil but most important thing is to have that particular um residue in the soil that's what promotes microbial you know activity is the residue without residue microbes are not going to function john thank you so much for your time we really appreciate your time uh, with us yes it's a uh, pleasure i posted the link for the um survey there just go ahead and click on it and complete it if there's any other question we'll wait maybe a minute or two uh, to finalize it. And then uh, I think uh, we can end it on this note if there is no further questions. So our next meeting, uh, we'll also send you a link for the next meeting. And then hopefully we'll be able to catch up with uh, the August meeting as well. John, thanks once again for me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right.